here. We have Rick from yes. Texas. Yes. Yeah. Um, I want to clear up the misconception of why women have pain in childbirth. So let's talk to you, Rick. All right, Rick, can you yeah, hear us? Well, it wasn't really. Yes. All right. Yeah. Tell me about clearing up this misconception. Okay. okay. Well, the misconception is actually that women were the uh, cause of the downfall of man. Uh, it's actually Adam. Man is the cause of all downfall of man. In the Bible is what it states. Uh, women were given pain during childbirth for the simple fact of listening to Satan instead of God. Okay. When they I want to stop you right there. I want to stop you right there. Excuse me. Excuse me, Rick. Excuse me. Um, so I want to know how you know, what. at what point did Eve listen to Satan? In the Garden of Eden? When okay. Satan appeared as a serpent. So how do you know that that was Satan? Where does it say in the Bible that that was Satan? Because later on in the Bible, it says that that was Satan, that he is a serpent, that he is um, the uh, the father of all lies and all that. And it touches but on how she does it say uh, to does his it, lies. Does it absolutely... Like I, I'm unfamiliar. I'm genuinely asking because the book of Genesis does not say that Satan was in the Garden of Eden. It it only says that there was a talking serpent. Um, I'm not familiar of anywhere in the Bible. Now I've said this before on the show. It's been a very long time since I've read the Bible uh, front to back or or in its entirety. I've, I've actually started re reading it recently, um, but I, I I don't know of any passage in the Bible. I don't know if I remember any that says it was in fact Satan in the Garden of Eden. Well, it does later in the Bible, but not in the book. Wait, of okay, you're kind of you're being very vague. You're just what I would say. First of all, can you tell me where in the later in the Bible? And then I would also say that the serpent isn't only used as a negative thing in the Bible because Christians are commanded to be as wily as serpents and as innocent as doves. I can't how I can't believe that that means that God wants us to be a little satanic. You know, so the serpent isn't only used as a negative thing in the Bible. Well. Satan is likened to a serpent, maybe occasionally, we're also supposed to be like serpents a little bit. So I'm a little confused again as to like how we know that Satan. Okay. Well, first of all, I just wanted to clear up the misconception of you directly stated that Eve mm -hmm. is the cause of all man's fall. That is not the case. Okay. He directly said that Adam was because he was not deceived. Okay, so he did it on his own free will. Okay, but I also, that's what I originally called up for, but then I heard the whole conversation with the last caller, and I would mm -hmm. actually like to touch on the cosmological let's, let's, argument. Well, hold let's on. do one at a time. Let's do one at a time here. Um, because I have sort of two questions. One being that Adam doing things of his own free will sort of implies that Eve didn't. And I feel like choosing to listen to the serpent, choosing to say, those are things that theoretically Eve had free will too. I think we're creating a kind of, you know, I hesitate to use the word a little bit, but sexist imbalance here where Eve was just a dumb girl and she was deceived and Adam totally knew what he was doing, but it was, you know, uh, so it's his fault really because he's, he's the smart brain. He's the big brain guy. Um, the other thing I would say is if Adam is the cause of man's downfall, why did women get the fun prize of having an incredibly risky childbirth process that not only causes pain, but oftentimes causes death and is one of the more major and dangerous medical procedures to this day? Well, they both got a horrible consequence due to it. Uh, why God chose that specific punishment for women, I don't know. I'm not God. I could not even try to answer that exact question like that. Do you that. see but, that you could say that about anything you know, that seems that unjust or bad? bad? Like, sorry, why does that? God allow any bad thing? Why does God, you know, seem to care if somebody finds their keys well. and not care if they're being molested? You could always just say, I don't know, I'm not God, and then you don't have to defend anything. No, 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 no. Why he chose that specific punishment, not another punishment, I don't know. Why he chose a punishment is because they disobeyed him. Yes, and that's but exactly why. If you disobey your parents, you're going to get a punishment, correct? 
yes, but if my younger sister gets one for something I did, that's unjust. So with Eve receiving a punishment like that, that then extends to all female kind, that seems pretty unjust, right? No, because they were perfect. And what had happened is um, when you have a mold, what? okay, let's say you're creating something, you have a mold, okay? And your original mold, the perfect, the first perfect people get a dent. Every single mold after that's going to have dents in it. That's why God didn't create death, but there's death in the world. Okay. So God couldn't have punished sin, Eve but now sin and it. not punished other women? Because that sort of implies the that there's no other option than was. this. He knew that the, the result of their sin was going to cause heartache down the line. That's why he didn't want us to sin in the beginning. See so wait, hold on. He knew the result of the sin would cause heartache down the line. And so he punished them, therefore causing heartache down the line. It feels like God is the person causing the heartache, not necessarily the people who initially committed the sin. Like and God I, could have chosen differently. Okay. Here. Yeah. And I've got, I, Rick, can I just, I, I don't want you to go back and forth. So I just want to add on, maybe you can consider my thoughts as well in your, in your uh, response to Sophia, but um, God didn't create death. You said that, that is a strikingly um, well shock. It's a shocking claim to make. I mean, God first says to them, uh, if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. And so death was a concept that God must have already created before Adam and Eve, long before Adam and Eve had died, because what was Adam's 900 years old or something like that when he died. Um, and then to say that he didn't want to create heartache, but then gives women childbirth on that note, uh, or excuse me, pain and childbirth on that note, think about how childbirth has caused heartache. Like childbirth is responsible for the death of many women. In fact, if we didn't have the facilities that we have today, uh, I would say the, the mortality rate during birth would be much, much higher. And, uh, you know, to say that God didn't create death and didn't want heartache uh, and then gave women this punishment that creates both of those things uh, is just a, a it's a, what's it called? It, it contradicts your statement. Okay. Uh, it doesn't because uh, let me explain like this. Okay. So if you do this one thing that I'm telling you do not do, okay, this is going to be the end result. Okay. Because you are now going to bring evil into the world which is going to bring along with it sin, death, misery, heartache, things I never created for you. I created you in a perfect paradise where you will live forever. Now, why did he not let them eat from the tree of life after they ate from the tree of good and evil? Um, sorry. Don't ask on. me. Yeah. He, made a, he made a perfect place with no sin in it except for one snake that you claim is Satan that he just stuck in there for fun. Yeah. He didn't stick him in there. He fell from heaven. He was an angel. So so God so, couldn't control whether... Then it wasn't a perfect place. That is God not in the Bible. A perfect place. I mean, that... Uh, uh, Rick, you're making this up, my friend, you know? And I'm sorry. Don't Please don't get worked up with us. I know I can tell you're getting, like, a little defensive. We just want to get to the bottom of this. I mean, you're saying a lot of things that are not in the Bible. They are not part of your doctrine. Uh, these are the first times in my life in 41 years that I have ever heard somebody say that God did not create death or that the serpent fell from heaven. I mean, these are extraordinary claims uh, with no basis, no foundation that you now have to, every time you say something like that, I mean, you've got to justify it. So now I got you. you have to, so we're, we're on, we're on, we're on the childbirth question, but in, in that, Answering that question, you have amassed the responsibility of say of of supporting that God did not create death, that He created people in a perfect paradise, that Satan is the serpent in the Garden of Eden, um, and I don't know. I, I think I lost you. Lost me. I mean, I'm 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 running out of fingers here. So okay. let's start from. So, yeah, go ahead. Um, no. God did not create death itself. No. Okay. It is a uh, um, result of consequences of not uh, obeying him. He knew, okay, because 
He knows everything, okay? He knew that disobeying him by eating the tree of good and evil would, in fact, bring death about, okay? He did not place the serpent in the garden. The serpent, Satan, chose to go there to try to get his special creation, okay? We are his special creation because we're the only one that he said he created in his image. Um, to no, we, fall, I mean, to fall, we wrote the book. Of course we said that. Him. So, I mean, even if we go along with all of that, there's a couple big problems. One being you earlier argued that we were put into this perfect place and that is why it's sort of okay for us to have the consequence of defying God or whatever. But then you mentioned that, well, there was the possibility of death entering the world and there was a snake kind of let in, but that wasn't God. That was just, you know, I don't know, a trap that God allowed to be there. So there's a lot of issues already with it you know, it's clearly not a perfect place. God was pretty okay with allowing a lot of opportunities for failure in the Garden of Eden. And as uh, one of our producers is pointing out in a chat right now, or in a message right now, uh, God would have known that they would have disobeyed him and he let those traps in anyway. So that all sort of seems like even if God didn't create death in that he just allowed it to happen or knew it would be the consequence, he sure left a lot of breadcrumbs so we could find our way to death ourselves. And he knew that we would. So this all seems like indicative to me of a pretty problematic God. Yeah. And, you know, before you respond, Rick, I just want to say, you know, why did God let the snake into the garden? I mean, this was his perfect place, right? So wouldn't, wouldn't this sinful snake entering the garden taint that? I mean, wouldn't this perfect creation that God made be tarnished? And God either didn't have the power to uh, to to get the snake out, uh, or you know He just didn't care to. But in either either case, you know the the humans that He just created were kind of victims, right? It wasn't really their fault. And then you know, if Satan, the snake, right, or the serpent, fell from heaven, uh, and then he was punished by God. Did God take him back up into heaven? Because then he's alongside God in the book of Job. Uh, and, and he's back. You know, him and God are, are back. He's an angel again. Um, later, Satan ten, uh, tempts Jesus, right? Uh, it's part of the process. Part of the process of Jesus becoming the Messiah and fulfilling his destiny. Did Satan, after being punished by God uh, multiple times at this point in the Gospels, all of a sudden turn around and say, hey, God, I'll help you with uh, with making this prophecy true and just, you know, go there to, to tempt Jesus. I mean, none of this makes sense, man. This is so inconsistent. It's not something that convinces me that the, the story is true. Okay. So to start off, yes, God does know the end from the beginning. Okay. He knows what's going to happen uh, throughout all of our lives to our death. He knows if we're going to accept him and he knows everything. Uh, he knows what sins we're going to commit, everything. He knows where we're going to end up in eternity. Um, so he knew that from the very beginning when he created all all of us. Now, why did he allow the tree in the Garden of Eden? Let's just start there. Why would I don't know. us to have a choice of eating the tree of good and evil, okay, of knowledge, Um but they didn't have a choice. Saying, hey, if, I don't want to obey you. But they didn't have a choice. They didn't have a choice. If he knew yeah. it was going to happen and he put the thing there anyway, then they mm -hmm. had no choice. I think I would okay. also venture that so, it doesn't – I mean, I, an argument I hear a lot for why a choice was given, if we're assuming that's even possible in this situation um, – which I would say it's as much of a choice as if I left a marshmallow in front of my, you know, one and a half year old and just left the room, you know, like I know what he's going to do. Right. I know he's going to try to eat it. Um, and no matter how badly I punish him after the fact, I knew that was probably going to happen. So it feels like it's kind of on me for letting that happen. Um, so I would agree. Sorry, there's a little rambly, but initially I would agree that that's not very much of a choice. But second, 
the idea that God gave us this test to give us free will is so often the argument that I hear used for this. Again, essentially says that if God wanted to save us, he could have. And he chose, instead of doing that directly, to cause immense suffering and condemn many people that he knew, as you've posited, would end up condemned, would end up in a horrible hellish afterlife, and just give us one apocalyptic preacher, you know, a couple thousand years ago, and call it good and say that that's saved enough. That's fine. He he chose that destruction by knowing what would happen. Can I answer y'all's question? You can try. I didn't get to answer any of y'all's questions. Okay, real quick. If I can answer, I'm going to go through a lot now because there's been a lot. Rick, you're up. you're doing it though. You're piling on new things. Yeah. You're, you're piling on the, all these new things. We can't just let them go. We can't just let them go. We're not going to ignore like these claims. All right, go ahead. <clears throat> more anything i'm willing to answer all of them i just need the time to do it okay so it's not a sermon uh, though so you gotta you gotta wrap it quick <laughs> he he knows the end from the beginning okay also he gave us free will by allowing the tree of knowledge to be in the garden of eden and he specifically said the only rule you have one rule okay do not eat from this tree if he hadn't done that we would be robots. We know. We know all this. Okay? We know There's all this. No way we could have sinned. Okay. We, we so know all this. That is indicative for free will. That is not just some bland argument for free will. It is the argument for free will. It's Without in the same kind of vein that my one and a half year old technically has free will if I leave a treat in front of him. Like he does. But it's so predictable what will happen if I do that, that I would argue it's actually more my responsibility as the intelligent grown being to be able to put him in a situation that's set up for success instead of one that's set up for failure. So, he yes, he has free will. Option. Why would he choose the, uh, the marshmallow? Be a bad option. Why would he choose the option to go against you? It's because, because he's he wants so the marshmallow. small and he has very limited decision-making capacity. It's not a decision to go against his mother. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, he, this is a, ch a baby, a child that just knows that the marshmallow is delicious. He's got a survival instinct. He has something inside of him telling him i want that highly uh caloric sweet thing in my body because it's going to be beneficial for me and it's going to taste great right this has nothing to do with this story of genesis that you're talking about and i i just we've covered a lot here uh we've got some other callers we want to get to and rick i just want to say that you called and made a claim initially that it wasn't eve that was the uh cause of downfall God literally says to Eve, uh, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. That is the terminology. So right there, you know, getting hearkening back to why you originally called, the reason is the woman. The reason for why humanity suffers throughout all time for, for all humans to suffer, or, or excuse me, all animals to suffer, is because of the woman, because the downfall that the woman put us on, and that has been used to subjugate women throughout history. This idea that women are responsible for the most heinous things uh, that we have endured as a people, as a species, uh, comes from works just like this. This is not just unique to the Bible. And so um, this whole idea that a loving and just God would give women and all species pain and childbirth that will kill them, uh, that will cause heartache, that will cause suffering because the first one of them ate an apple from a talking serpent is what people want me to teach my children in schools. I mean, this is asinine. This is asinine. And that's my final thought. I'm going to kick it back over to our host. Yeah, I kind of, I think that we, we, I know you're saying you haven't had a chance to fully answer this question, but I feel like we've we've hit a lot of the same themes coming round and round. And, you know, I know you want time, but maybe that's that's better put in an email because it's a talk show, not a sermon. Um, it's all of these arguments are ones we 
I would argue growing up in the church have heard before. It's a way of speaking from ideology instead of speaking from the Bible that's actually in front of us. And I think we've pointed out several times some of the issues with that. Um, I think even just the response that my toddler would be going against me to choose something that he really wants is already indicative of a way that we see humans based upon the need for them to fit into this ideology, that we see humans as the they must be defiant, not just a, a silly little dude without a ton of great judgment because he's very small. Um, so I am happy to give you kind of a, a last statement here, but then I think we do need to move on. Okay. So uh, the other guy said that um, nowhere in there is it saying that uh, Adam is the reason for the fall of all mankind. But when you read in the New Testament, Paul writes that the first Adam brought death to the world, the fall of man. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, bought, brought uh, salvation to all mankind. How so, convenient. Yeah, How convenient that an author 2,000 years later takes an old fairy tale, an old piece of folklore, and adapts it to his own message. Right? It's the same thing. You know, I asked you where the Bible says that Satan is the serpent. They put it in Revelation. Uh, it says Satan is a serpent. Didn't say Satan was the serpent. That's the only claim in the Bible. Um and, you know, these these authors that are around 2000 years later that are trying to uh, create this new religion, create this new order in society by which uh, they are going to offer people a better life after this really shitty one that they have now are using kind of these old concepts that have stuck with people uh, and adapting them to sell their product. And that's what we have. That's what the Bible is. The Bible is a compilation of a bunch of stories adapted to make sense uh, to, to some people that, that uh, you know, the authors and, and the people in charge, I should say, uh, you know, can use against the ones that they want to subjugate. Um, yeah. Look, it's also, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was done. It's also very easy to reframe um, whatever it happened in the past into something that actually means something in particular in the present. So it's very easy for Paul to come and say, well, this is actually what that story meant, exactly as Jimmy was saying 2,000 years later, because it's really convenient for the audience that he's preaching to right then. Um, I would argue that in the Bible, there is a distinction also between what Paul says and what is sort of Paul's opinion and what Jesus says. And I wouldn't hold them when I was a Christian, absolutely. Um, but especially now, I, I wouldn't interpret them as being sort of of equal value if we're trying to make an argument about what was actually happening in the Old Testament. Um, with Paul, he also has quite a history of either erasing women or demeaning women. So of course he's leaving Eve out of the story because women in no way can be, can be leaders or in no way have independent thoughts. So I don't find that a particularly compelling argument because Paul had an opinion later on. I mean, we reframe things all the time from Christianity 2000 years ago to Christianity now. God didn't really mean, you know, Paul, Paul even says don't use instruments actually in church. And I think a lot of Christians reframe that now and say, let's put it in context of the time or for women to never speak in church. And yet I see in some of the most conservative denominations, women giving testimonies. Like there's a lot of things that Paul says that we reframe. So it's not really shocking to look back and think that maybe Paul reframed some things, but we got to move on. Um, I think, you know, thank you very much for calling. Um, but I think that we've gone as far as we're going to go.